Shalom today on YouTube. Thanks for joining us in our Bible study. My name is James Emmanuel White. Today we'll be reading and learning from Bob Mendelssohn, our regional director of Jews for Jesus Australasia, about what God has to say about false confidences from Jeremiah chapter 9. If you haven't yet read it, please stop the video right here and do so. Join us because for 25 minutes, Bob will teach us and then invite you back into the room for a Q&A. By the way, the Q&A is not recorded here. So if you'd like to join us on the call, please write to us at admin at jewsforjesus.org.au and we will send you an invite so you can join us on that call. If you haven't yet subscribed to our YouTube channel, please press like right here. That will get people directed to our channel. Now, that will be good, won't it? Before we start this Bible study, we are going to actually have a friend of Bob's sing a song that he wrote from Jeremiah 9. Steve Israel is his name. The song in this season, very appropriate. Please, Steve. Take it away. And knows me that I am the Lord who exercises loving kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth. For I delight, for I delight, for I delight in these things. For I delight, for I delight, for I delight in these things. Let not a wise man boast of his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast of his might. Let not a rich man boast of his riches. But let him who boasts boast of this. That he understands. And knows me that I am the Lord who exercises loving kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth. For I delight, for I delight. Okay, thanks Jimmy. 
I don't know what you think or have thought when you've been reading through this prophecy of Jeremiah. It's not a happy book. It's not a Hollywood musical ending with the family restored, the boy meets girl ending in a happy wedding. Actually, on a broader level, I don't know how you deal with any failure, either your own or your national sin. That will be impacted by studying this book also. Most of us on this call know that two days ago, Wednesday, was Australia Day, 26 January, and its locked-in date as a public holiday is actually less than 30 years old. Captain Cook arrived in what we now call Australia in January 1788, and although it was not known as Australia Day until over a century later, records of celebrations on 26 January date back to 1808, with the first official celebration of the formation of our colony, now a state, New South Wales, held in 1818, yeah, over 200 years ago. On New Year's Day, 1901, the British colonies of Australia formed a federation, marking the birth of modern political Australia. A national day of unity and celebration was hunted, and it wasn't until 1935 that all the Australian states and territories adopted use of the term Australia Day to mark the dates, and not until 1994 that the date was consistently marked by a public holiday on that day by all the states and territories. That said, tens of thousands of ordinary Australians this week marched on the 50th anniversary of the Tent Embassy against the substance and celebrations which they sometimes title Invasion Day. Whatever your opinion of celebrations this week, it's clear that our national history includes much wrong, uh, sometimes downright evil, against the First Nations peoples and the stolen generations. Then let me ask, what do you do to handle problems like national sin? What about modern day Israel and the way the nation there handles COVID or the problems brought by Hamas and Hezbollah? What do you feel about territories that have been historically settled by Arabs from various countries and tribes and which now are being confiscated, reclaimed, and resettled by mostly expat Jews from around the globe. The answers are not simple, and they probably were not simple in Jeremiah's day in the 6th century BCE. Remember who he is. He's the weeping prophet. He's so sad when he ponders the sins and reluctance to listen to the Almighty by the Jewish people. Jeremiah was exasperated. He's frustrated. He's sick in his gut. His grief is thick as thieves, and his prophecy continues here in chapter 9 with commensurate pains. Let's dig into this chapter and hear. Let's really hear what God is saying to us as a people. Craigie calls this opening section the sorrow of God. That strikes a chord with me. It's believably sad, painfully sad. He says this of verse 1, As the lament by Jeremiah concluded with a contrary-to-fact wish, so this divine lament begins with a contrary-to-fact wish. The almost unthinkable idea that God would wish to leave his people and retire to the wilderness is shocking and emphasizes the gravity of the situation. Look at it there in verse 1. The object of sadness is, it says, for the slain of the daughter of my people. But the Hebrew is, chalalei batami. It sounds like the defiled of the daughter of my people. The imagery is clear. We, as the tender daughter, not the rough son, not the expected power broker, not the manager of the estate, but the daughter, the apple of the father's eye. The love of the parents is lost to defilement. It's a gender-specific way of saying Judah is off the deep end. Today's chapter breaks down as follows. Uh, first, we'll look at these verses of societal breakdown. And, and this is the crux of the argument. 
the family, the congregation, the rulership or the leadership, all are broken. All are gone from the plans and the rule or kingdom of God. Look at it, verse 2. It says, All of them are adulterers, an assembly of treacherous men. How does this work? All of them? This is when the perverse has permeated the populace and everyone is unchecked in doing evil. The word treacherous, as we saw previously, Jeremiah seems to like this word, is from the Hebrew word bagad, meaning clothing. And it relates to those who change their clothing, change their outward appearance to lure others into their evil practice. This is when the world sees evil and dwells in it. They abide evil. They practice evil. They delight in evil. One of my cousins and I were speaking this morning about scams. What is it that makes us so sad when we watch the news and we hear about elderly people who are scammed out of their life savings? It's just wrong, we shout. My cousin and I both had fathers who were lured into thinking that the publisher's clearinghouse magazine sales was going to be sending them a check for $250,000, which in those days was like millions in today's world. And you might remember the African emails with promises of millions of dollars if you would just send them your bank details and password. And the husband-to-be who needs just a little bit of funds to get them across the line while their other money is tied up. And then they lure the unsuspecting woman, usually, into giving them tens, hundreds of thousands of dollars. These are examples of this type of stealing and cheating, which Jeremiah highlights in verse 4. Let everyone be on his guard against his neighbor, and do not trust any brother, because every brother deals craftily, and every neighbor goes about as a slanderer. Remember in the Noah story that the whole world, according to the summary, was continuously performing evil, and God said, I've had it up to here. I've had enough of that. And he brought the flood and judged the world. There is an end to the patience of God. Verse 5, the academies of lying are more than the art schools and scholastic centers. That's the way I sum it up. Look what it says. Verse 5, everyone deceives his neighbor and does not speak the truth. They have taught their tongue to speak lies. They weary themselves committing iniquity. Look at the movies and how lying is normalized. Look at every TV show when people de deceive and, and uh, Seinfeld characterized the 90s and defined the 90s and friends and uh, these TV shows that were landmark and were, were normal and everybody watched them, or at least in some circles. And it is characterized by sarcasm and lying. Look at the news. Uh, Novak Djokovic, Andrew O'Keefe, Prince Andrew, and any number of famous and not so famous. The world is full of liars. And yes, what does it say? They weary themselves committing iniquity. This is a horrible and sad state of affairs. Verse 6, the end is deceit, but that's not the end. Your dwelling is in the midst of deceit. Through deceit, they refuse to know me, declares the Lord. There's the ticket out of this mess. It's not religion. It's not rules and it's not devotion. It's not promises, promises, promises. It's knowing the living God who was, who is, and who is to come. But what, did we, what does it say? We refused to know him. In other words, we made a choice and at that, a bad choice. What, is, what choice does God have? So our second section, verses 7 to 11, here is God breaking down in response. 
The next section of our chapter starts with lechen, that is, therefore. Given all the enormity of the sin and corruption of the people of God, it's almost like God says, what choice do I have? What would you do if you were God? It's almost as if he's saying, what does God have option? What's his option but to judge us? Look at verse 7. What else can I do? <laughs> this is this is frustration. This is, look, friends, there are times in the prophecy of this book when we cannot determine which speaker is speaking. But there is no ambiguity here. God's passion is for the people. But he has no choice but to, look at verse 11, make Jerusalem a heap of ruins and make Jerusalem, sorry, and make the cities of Judah a desolation without inhabitant. It aches the heart of God to do this. Remember when you had your parents tell you, this is going to hurt me more than you, and maybe you as a parent have said that, and maybe you meant it, and maybe it was true. If you really love those whom you judge, it really does hurt. The next section, God explains himself in verses 12 to 16. It's his reasoning in judgment. It's iconic, it's honest, it's forthright, it's simple enough, both for the people of Jeremiah's day and, dare I say, for us in our day as well. Look at verse 12. He says, you want to know why? Why is the land ruined, laid waste like a desert? You want to know why? Verse 13 because you forsook Torah and you didn't listen to it. That's, what's that labeled? In theological terms, that's called apostasy, apostatos, away from stand, standing away from God. It's not um, not understanding. It is turning away from, giving your back to the Almighty. Not a recommended stance at all. Verse 14, following other gods. Hmm. What's that called? In theology, it's idolatry. The root cause of all of our problem, choosing wrong, and dare I say, other gods, even though they're not really gods, rather than the one true God who brought us out of the land of Egypt. What will be the result? Look, verse 15 and 16, exile and death. That's what it says. Moses had warned us of the same problems around 800 years earlier in Deuteronomy 29. Feel free to read that later. Read that and weep with Jeremiah. Read that and weep with Moses. Read that and weep with God himself. Verses 17 to 22. Hmm utter sadness. Professional mourners are basically unknown to us in modern society uh, in the West. But I remember being with my wife in Morocco and seeing this played out years ago. A parade of people were walking up the footpath, actually the street, it was a, a small street, where we were in Tangiers. They were weeping, they were wailing, and then we saw a box held up by a few folks, and we realized hmm, that the box was a coffin. The procession only lasted a few minutes, but everyone in that area stopped what they were doing, walked out of their stores and homes, and stood in their doorways, and stood at attention as the parade continued past. They honored the dead. In this reading from verse 17, the dead were mourned by professionals, women who were called on, what does it say in verse 17? Consider and call for the mourning women that they may come and send for the wailing women that they may come. Let them make haste and take up a wailing for us that our eyes may shed tears. Hmm. But wait, it wasn't just for that moment, but for others down the road. Look at verse 20. 
Now hear the word of the Lord, O you women, and let your ear receive the word of his mouth. Teach your daughters wailing, and everyone her neighbor a dirge. Women, professional mourners, teach your daughters to do the same. That means this is going to be longer than this generation. It's going to be ongoing. Judah, you are in deep trouble. It is utterly sad. Then we get to verses 23 to the end. I'm amazed at these two verses that we just listened to by Steve Israel, my friend from Washington, D.C. He's originally from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Steve and I met each other back in the 80s in Mobile, Alabama, and we've been friends ever since. His wife, Barbara, they have two children. They are, uh, Steve and I are the same age, although he's significantly older, two months, and, uh, and um, we both married well. Steve uh, wrote that song back in the 80s, and I don't know that he knew that I'd be teaching the book of Jeremiah but when I think of these, these, this text, let not the wise man boast of his wisdom, etc. I think of Steve, I think of that song, because I think maybe we should make this, not Jeremiah 31, not Jeremiah 23, not Jeremiah. There's so many great texts that are memorable and well-known by people. Uh, but I, I suspect that this should be the theme of the entire book. I'm amazed at these two verses, what people value, whether strength in the Olympics, which are starting next week, in the tennis of the Australian Open, which for goodness sakes, I keep staying up ridiculously late and watching, or the NFL playoffs, go Chiefs, and other sports we observe so devotedly. Strength is valued. Uh, but what about the saber rattling of Putin and Russia versus Ukraine just now? Strength, not in sport, but in politics, can be nothing but naked power and violence or wisdom. Don't let the wise man boast in his wisdom. Wisdom can lead to intellectual dignity, which is fine. But then it moves so rapidly to intellectual superiority and pride. Even riches, when dispersed to us, are wonderful, as a job and the worth given due to its presence is great. But when riches make themselves wings, like the proverb says, and fly away, we desperately long for them, and they become the idol of greed and self-centeredness. All three, wisdom, strength, and riches, can be useful to a person, and certainly to a society, but without God at the center, they are idols in the making and destined the person to failure. No wonder Jeremiah warns us not to boast in those. But we can boast. But let him boast in this, that he understands and knows me. We can boast we have a relationship with the one who's above all. Now, Radak that's uh, Rabbi David, I want to say kimchi, but I think there's no C, uh, kimhi, uh, was a, thir a 12th, 13th century French rabbi superlative. He said this, in this section, in his commentary on Jeremiah, quote, to know God is to imitate his ways by dealing with others in kindness, justice, and righteousness, for such is my desire, end quote. But that bothers me. Knowing my wife is not imitating her. Knowing a sports hero like Patrick Mahomes or Steve Smith at the crease might lead me to imitation, but that's not knowing a person. Getting up close and personal, knowing what they eat for breakfast or what surprised them last month, knowing what makes them happy or, or sad, that's getting to know a person. Hosea said this, let us, let us know, let us press on to know the Lord. His goings forth are as certain as the dawn. Knowing is not knowing about. It's, knowing about is a good beginning, but it's not knowing. It's personal. Radak 
got that wrong. Unless he was taking an HSC or SAT exam, it's not information, it's relationship. That's what Jeremiah is saying. Boast that you understand and know me. Then practice justice, kindness, and righteousness on earth. Great, do those things, but don't forget it's a relationship. Those who know what's coming next in chapters 10 and following, you know that kindness is not the word you would usually use or choose to describe the actions of justice coming down the pike. But chesed, kindness here, is just that. If God does not judge sin and those who are committed to making sin happen, he's not kind. Christopher Wright says this in his commentary, quote, in the long story of God's mission, the nations will have reason to praise God for the history of Israel, even including the conquest, for it will become an integral part of the whole story of salvation that led to Calvary and open the gate of eternal life to all nations. Similarly, he goes on, the remnant of Israel will come to see the name and character of Yahweh vindicated, both in the exile as an act of his righteous judgment and in the restoration as an act of his loving grace." <laughs> End quote. The chapter ends by comparing circumcised Judah to the nations around them. Uh, you may not know that the other nations around, many of them practice circumcision, but externals are never enough. Craigie says this, quote, neither Jeremiah nor Deuteronomy advocate physical circumcision, but instead speak of circumcision of the heart, or remember a couple chapters ago, circumcision of the ears. Clearly, only the symbolic meaning of circumcision is considered important. Circumcision was meant to show special status or perhaps to protect from God's anger. Calling the people uncircumcised of heart declared they had no special status or protection. Judgment would fall upon them all. This is echoed in the writings of Paul as with the previous oracle. The thought behind it, you can see that in Romans chapter 2. Friends, this is a tough chapter to preach. It's a tough chapter to endure and to consider. Jimmy, let me turn it back over to you. Dear friends, I don't know where you are, but I know someone that does. He wants to locate you and wants to have relationship with you. God is calling you into relationship. You may not think so, but there's that yearning in your heart. There's that vacuum, that God-shaped vacuum that's been once called. He wants to fill it right where you are, right where you are right now, please, in your own words. Why don't you just ask him to come? And I promise you, he will. Just in your own words, Father, help me. Help me know you. Help me to come into relationship with you. I want to have the peace that I heard that you give. I want to forsake my idolatry. I want to forsake my sin. And you've made a way for me to do just that. It is in Yeshua. For I heard he is the way, the truth, and the life. If you would come, I would accept you. I would come into relationship with you. That's the promise you've made. Listen, if you said those kind of words in your own heart, in your with your own mouth, to God. It's a promise that he says he'll do just that. So why don't you write to us at admin at jewsforjesus.org.au and tell us you've done something similar to that. We would love to send you some literature. We'd love to pray with you. We'd love to believe with you. We'd love to stand with you. We would just like to go on a love journey with you and God from here to eternity. Please let us know at admin at jewsforjesus.org.au. And until next time, let's see one another on this channel. Shabbat Shalom.